Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. My name is Meredith Gershenson. I'm a research analyst here at Workforce.com. And today, as the title suggests, we're going to talk a little bit about how to upskill shift workers. Today, I am joined by Sheila Farr. Sheila, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm very excited about today. Awesome. So Sheila is the CEO at Gulf Coast Training and board member of Sherm Mississippi's chapter. She is also an author. Sheila has more than 25 years of experience in the fields of human resources, admin management, training, and education. With a passion for lifelong learning, Sheila started Gulf Coast Training and Education ser Services to help others gain knowledge and skills required to stay current and relevant in today's workforce. And current and relevancy is exactly what we're going to talk about today. Sheila, I'm so excited to have you on. Thank you again. Yeah, I love it. Thanks again. Awesome. Uh, to give everyone a quick run through on our webinar platform here, for those of you who have already come, I'm sure you know about this, but we have the chat box to the right. First and foremost, I would love for everyone to get acquainted with it. Let me hear where you're coming in from. Today, I'm coming in from sunny Chicago, where the weather is just perfect, a nice 70 degrees. So feel free to drop it in the chat. Uh, the chat box is also where we're going to be dropping in any questions that you might have. So feel free to drop in those questions there. At the end, we'll do a nice Q&A with Sheila at the last 15 minutes or so. We also have a couple poll questions uh, throughout the webinar itself. So those are just going to be popping up right on the bottom left of your screen. It's a really great way for me to kind of get a sense of where everyone's heads are at. So be sure to interact with those. I'm seeing everyone coming in. Awesome. We also have Stephanie coming in from Chicago, too. I love it. Robert, always good to see you. This is awesome. Oh, my God. This is so, so great. It's great to see everyone. Awesome. So and then quickly to sum up our little run through, uh, we also have a couple handouts today. We have not just one, but two. So we have a great article that's going to summarize a lot of what we're going to talk about here. I'll be sure to pass that out at the end. Also, I'll be sure to email it to you. It's going to be titled, What is Skills Management Maximizing Productivity and Engagement? Uh, we also have a really awesome handout thanks to Sheila and you know her uh, business partners over at Gulf Coast, a little um, filling out of a PDF that's going to be super relevant for you guys and helping to upskill those shift workers. So I will also be sure to hand that out. And for those who are coming in live, we are offering SHRM and HRCI PDC credits. So if you're a member of either of these organizations, I will share these PDC IDs at the very end of the webinar. So be sure to stick around for its entirety. And finally, a little background on Workforce.com, a little bit of what we do here. We're an HCM software company that specializes for businesses with hourly staff. Uh, we run these webinar series to prevent our learnings and data from our own clients. Great. Now we've got all the fun stuff out of the way. This is also really cool to see where everyone's coming in from. We are pretty much, we're almost worldwide, it looks like, at least nationally. <laughs> this is great. Thank you, guys. Um, okay, Sheila, so tell me about some of the work you do and some of the clients that you actually work with. Yeah, so we do, well, man, we're so fortunate to be able to, to work with a really broad range of types of people and businesses. So we work with everybody from entrepreneurs, small businesses to larger corporations uh, here in the state of Mississippi, but also globally, thankfully. It's really kind of a cool thing to do. Uh, so we work with uh, a lot of healthcare organizations, uh, insurance companies, engineers, accounting firms, uh, nonprofits, and community service um, providers. So kind of just a really broad range of folks. And what we do for them is just kind of look at where they are in their business and where they want to go. And then we develop a plan to get them there. So whether it, it uh, revolves around training, financing, um, just business strategy in general, uh, we look at that and we help them kind of reach those reach the goals that they set. Uh, recently, we've had a really neat um, need for leadership training and communication training yeah. and collaboration training because yeah. uh, you, that's one of the the really um, really big trends right now that I'm seeing upskilling is people needing to to know how to work together better. Mm -hmm. So um, that's been really fun. And then we, we do kind of everything from leadership management, uh, all of the soft skills to even crisis prevention and intervention now. So that's been really neat too. Nice. Yeah. And you mentioned a couple of things there, but you mentioned that you work with a lot of different hourly wage or shift mm -hmm. 
based workforces. Are there any trends that you're noticing maybe specific to one or the other, or is it pretty all encompassing? Everybody seems to be having kind of a similar challenge right now. Mm -hmm. uh, people shortages are a big thing yep. uh, in, in learning. It's just staying relevant mm -hmm. and staying um, efficient in the way that they're managing and running their business. Um, and it's a really neat time because right now, you know, we have all the generations in the workforce. Uh, so that's a really cool, cool thing for me to watch because that's one of my passions is to, just to help people from different generations kind of get along together and understand how to communicate and work together. So honestly, that's what I'm seeing a lot of right now. Mm -hmm. It's really a cool thing. Yeah, that's awesome. And you mentioned that you are actually on the Mississippi chapter of the SHRM board. I want to hear about some of the experiences uh, with SHRM and what it's like being a board member, generally speaking. It's incredible, especially here in the state of Mississippi. Um, one thing that we're really focusing on in our state is developing healthy work cultures as a whole. So our, our chapter in our state is really focused on looking at our businesses and seeing how we can help them achieve those goals. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, um, do we need to, to kind of look at DEI and kind or, you know, and lead things towards that way? Do we need skills training? Um, you know, what, what is it that we need in our workforces and in our work culture to make Mississippi stronger and to make our um, workers healthier, mm -hmm. uh, more engaged and um, really more involved in what they're doing from the day to day? So it's been really good. Uh, I've been the workforce readiness director for the chapter here along the Mississippi Gulf Coast and sure. then for the state of Mississippi for the past three years. Uh -huh. So I'm kind of on the downhill slope of my time here on the board as the workforce readiness director. But um, what we've done is at that is just we provide a lot of free training every month. So whether it's it's HR related or directed training, uh, we just did a really cool uh, seminar on workers' compensation, what it is, how you manipulate through the system. We've done some training on uh, how to attract top talent and then how to onboard successfully. So you keep those people that everybody's working so hard to find. So uh, we just really kind of find out, you know, what the needs are and we work mm -hmm. to meet those needs. It's been really I love fun. that. That's awesome. So what are some of the common questions or even issues that you and the board come across um, from other SHRM members even? Um, really, it's just how do you do it? You know, how do you how do you keep your workforces yeah. engaged? <laughs> That's <laughs> a you, great question. How do you do it? <laughs> how do you do it? How do you keep people talking, you know, to right. each other? Because it's so hard, uh, even though with technology, everything is, is so accessible, yet it's so difficult to get a hold of each other these days, right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think really that's that's one of the, the things that we get asked, asked most often mm -hmm. um, is just what's the what's the best way to communicate with people? And I always say, just stick with it. Yeah. <laughs> just if you need something from somebody, don't give up, be relentless sure. and uh, don't be afraid to collaborate. I know a lot of times people will hold, um, people will hold their um, information and kind of guard it and they don't want to share it. So what we have to do is kind of encourage people that it's okay to collaborate with other people mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that we all do better together. So, so kind of encouraging people to, to let, let go of some of the, the control that they have in their businesses and in their projects and just kind of learn from different people and different perspectives. It just makes things stronger. I love that. Yeah. I mean, we've had a couple of webinars where the overarching theme, right, is communication is at least the baseline of HR and it's like a muscle. You got to keep exercising it for sure. Right. Um, I want to flip the script more on the upskilling side of things before we dive into the nitty gritty of where communication really falls into place here. So in your opinion, you know, we talked about how upskilling has been a very hot topic over the past couple of weeks for sure. So why is upskilling so important in today's workforce, generally speaking? Well, I'm, for a lot of different reasons, and it can look mm -hmm. different to, to a lot of different people. Um, it, it helps us build stronger organizations. It helps us. Um, sorry, I've got a knock at my door. I apologize. Yeah. For that. It's distracting me. Um, it, it helps us build stronger organizations. It helps us as employees uh, become more engaged in what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just it builds stronger workplaces. Uh, it also 
personally, it encourages and uplifts people. And especially with this being Mental Health Awareness Month, uh, that's one thing that we're really focusing on is, is our mindset and our mindset at work and how yep. that makes the difference in the way that we perform our jobs. So knowing, uh, honestly, what your goals are as, as it relates to job performance or where you hope to go in the future. What Where do you want to be? You know, kind of starting backwards, uh, you know, starting at the end where you want to go and working backwards to what are the things that you need to do to get there? What are the steps that you need to take to get there? Uh, if you're getting stuck for any reason, what what's sticking you? What what is what is it that's making you you know, not be able to move forward. Yeah. So Nice. I love yeah. that. I asked the question in the polls. I asked how important is upskilling your organization and what are the main barriers that you're facing in implementing upskilling programs? And we'll kind of go mm -hmm. in to curating these programs later on in the webinar. Very important stuff. But I think it's really important to talk about the aspect of time management. That's a mm -hmm. big trend in what I'm seeing in these poll responses. Some people are just saying, <laughs> Plain and simple time. Somebody said, uh, yes, it's very important to us, but time is a factor in finding the time to talk to employees about it and helping the owner see the importance as well. And I think that perfectly encapsulates where HR is in kind of this weird no man's land of not feeling like they have the time or money or labor dollars to really put forward these programs, but at the same time, you know, not necessarily being able to fully prove its worth in these programs because they don't have the time. It's, you know, it's this endless cycle. I talk about this cycle a lot in the webinar. So I'm curious on what your thoughts are on that and the aspect of time management and building these programs and making sure that upskilling is ranking higher in that importance, especially in today's day and age. Yeah, that's a biggie, but you have to kind of, that's the thing. You have to set your priority. You know, what's yeah. most important if you're struggling at work, What's causing you to struggle? You can't just avoid and say, well, we're too busy to deal with this, you know, sure. uh, because that's what causes more trouble. Right. And that's what causes people to get frustrated at work and leave their jobs. Yep. You know, and that's why we're having all these the trouble with with getting people up. Meredith, I apologize. May I, may I just step of course, away? No, of course. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm so Go sorry. ahead. It's this work from home lifestyle. I get it. <laughs> I'm really appreciating everyone in the chat and the poll questions, making sure that they're filling this out. This is really great. I want to shout some out while we're waiting for Sheila. Um, some people said um, upskilling is extremely important in our organization, manufacturing and fabrication. A barrier would be getting enough people interested in it, making it worth for everyone involved. That aspect of team leadership, loyalty within the organization, not just from you know, we've got the entry level, mid managers, upper management, maybe possibly all the way to exec. Everyone needs to be on the same page with this stuff. And we're going to talk a lot about that. Yeah. Sorry for that. No worries. <laughs> no worries. I was just saying, you know, that work from home lifestyle, it gets you. It totally gets you. I it get really it. It does. And I told, you, I told you before we got on the line, there's okay, there's lawnmowers going everywhere. It never fails. But no, hey, this is real life, right? No worries. It, it very much is. Um, I want to talk about, you know, some of the specific skills that are more or less in high demand right now. You know, what we're seeing a lot of these mm -hmm. shift based workers wanting in terms of upskilling. So I want to point first and foremost to this first slide. And if you guys came to a webinar a couple of weeks ago, this slide might look very familiar. It's because we actually have had it on in the past. And I wanted to reiterate it here. You know, it's very, it pertains greatly, obviously, to the topic we're talking about today. And it's an awesome uh, ebook I got from Vizier, I think it's pronounced. And it talks about, you know, what skills, what are the top reasons people are quitting their jobs, what skills they're looking for. And Sheila, my question for you, is this reflective of some of the work that you've done with some companies in terms of what they're looking for in upskilling and what they're looking for in making sure that they have as a tool in their tool belt, so to speak. It really is. It's almost just verbatim what I would say if I had to shoot something off to tell you what, what, what the most sought after uh, skills are right now that people are really working to kind of up level uh, communication. I might bump up just a little bit more because it seems like that's where we're having a ton of uh, ton of conflict these days. People just are, are, and I think people are struggling with that. And I think maybe it's because we're coming off of this time, these past three or four years where everybody's been kind of in this funk and they've been kind of isolated into themselves. Uh, so now coming back out into the workforce, um, it's, it's been a struggle for some people, but 
yeah, I think these are really reflective of, uh, of as a whole, mm-hmm. what people are, are looking to, to upskill and reskill even. Yeah. Would you say that possibly it depends on which industry we're talking about? So let's say if we're comparing healthcare to maybe even manufacturing or hospitality, would you say that these, you know, in demand, most sought after skills might be reordered in some extent? Somewhat, and mm-hmm. they could be, but overall, I think they're really pretty accurate. And mm-hmm. I just want to pop back to time management for, for just a just sure. a second. And if somebody was asking, you know, what can we do to, to manage our time better? Well, I, I think a lot of times when we think of upskilling, we think of, oh, I have to go to a class or I have to watch a webinar or I have to, you know, there's something that you have to do out in and of outside of work, but you really can upskill at work. Uh, so if you have a, an employee that is excellent at doing something, you know, stick your stick your person that needs help with that with that person and let them tag team and kind of work together. Mm-hmm. Uh, mentorship is is a really great thing. And it gives people an opportunity to kind of uh, be the leader and learn how to lead others. And it also does great, uh, great things for growing people within your organization. So I think a lot of times HR directors will think they have to look outside of, of what they have to, to do something, but yeah. that's not always the case. You know, sometimes just getting feedback too from other people, like those three, 360 degree feedback sessions sure. where you get everybody involved in talking. Uh, those are really helpful um, because you get, you know, we get such tunnel vision. And so having uh, opportunities to have other people kind of give us a little bit of, of uh, constructive feedback uh, really, if, if you're if you're a person who's really looking to to grow and to upscale and to upskill, um, it makes a difference. Yeah. You know, if you're a person that kind of takes things personal or you're not in a place that you can hear that or receive that, it might be a little bit challenging. But I would say to those that are having a struggle with time management, don't feel like you have to go outside and do some big grand thing to to help grow your people. You can do it right where you are. I mean, so much of the golden information lies within your frontline employees. Truly, it's those people that are working the cash register. It's those people that are working the floor, people that are running through the hallways in the hospital, whatever it might be. Those are the people that the feedback is so, so important to gather and on a consistent basis. My other question for you regarding time management is where does technology, you know, come into play? Where have you seen it most helpful being used in terms of making sure that HR has the time to gather this feedback and knowing what skills that their employees want to upskill? Well, I think I think this is where we kind of fall short because we don't really talk to people, to those first line workers and find out what their needs are. Um, And we don't as typically this, and this is what I'm seeing just kind of in the, the spaces that I've been in working with people. They don't have plans for growth for their people or oftentimes even their business. Right. You know, it's just kind of surviving through the day to day. And I think that's where you struggle right there, because if you don't have a plan and you don't make a plan for it, uh, then it's not going to happen. So uh, it doesn't matter, you know, what kind of technology you're using to enhance your your the skills of your employees? It's not going to be effective if mm-hmm. you don't properly plan for it. Right. So and it, I think where you know this is where what we do at Workforce. This is what we do in terms of helping to make sure that you have the time. So instead mm-hmm. of worrying about okay, I need to make sure that these are the skills and I need to track them in some way. That's what we do. You know, like that's what we do best. So I think it's more about having the time opposed to getting all the documents ready and making sure that you're going to all these seminars and stuff to make sure that you're doing it correctly. No, no. It's making sure that you have everything already handled from the technology standpoint. So you can focus on the communication with your employees. So you can focus on putting that information into technology and that's where we come in. So I think that's so important. Yeah. I want to talk about some of the common challenges that you're seeing or even mistakes that organizations are facing when trying to uh, implement upskilling initiatives. Um, Honestly, just those things we talked about, um, Mm -hmm. kind of a failure to plan for change. Um, So in, and this is true, I think for a lot of smaller businesses, smaller being like 50 employees under 50 or under, Um, it's like people do their business plans and they have a plan for everything. But then when they open their business or they start doing their work, they put all that stuff away and they never visit it again. 
Yeah. You know, and that's the blueprint to your organization. That's your blueprint to how what's going to happen next in the in the chain of events of things that happen next. So really not planning appropriately or not planning at all uh, and just kind of taking things as they come and trying to, to manage by crisis. That's yeah. that's one thing that I see a lot of out there, uh, which it, in my head, it, it's like that does not compute because I'm such a planner. So I'm like, how can you not plan for this? Um, but really just the, the planning, assessing the needs, just kind of really looking at, at where the struggle is and what would make it better, you know, and, and um, just just kind of taking time because everybody is so, you know, rushed for time. They're there. They just want to do their job. So all of these kind of uh, peripheral things that are sitting out here that could make things so much better kind of just could push to the wayside because we don't make time for it, but it's not going to happen unless you actually make the time for it. So whether that looks like uh, blocking off even 15 minutes of your day before or, you know, at at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day, just to address those things, Uh, just, you know, failing to plan, failing to analyze, you know, not looking at the data, not looking at, you know, what your people are doing or saying, Mm -hmm. you know, and and they're out there waving hands saying, Hey, we have trouble, help us, (laughs) you know, and we get so focused on the work that we just kind of put blinders onto those other things. So, so those are the challenges that I see most frequently out there. I mean, you are speaking directly to me when you say, (laughs) when you say it's, it's one of those things where I think people start off strong with these Mm -hmm. programs and they really are, we're going to do this. We're going to do it right. We're going to get feedback from everyone on a constant basis. We're really going to make sure that everyone's comfortable. They, you know, that we know what skills that they want to upskill in and they start off strong. And this is where my own pitfalls come in, where I start tapering off, right? It starts to become, we're doing it, we're doing great. And then, oh, you know, we're not going to actually enter, or we're not going to get feedback from everyone on a consistent basis as much. Oh, you know what? That's okay. We'll just put it aside. And then it starts becoming again, the snowball of, we need to make sure we're upskilling our (laughs) staff and make sure that these programs are in place. So my question for you is how can people, you know, make sure that these initiatives are successful long-term? Make your employees part of the process. Mm, I love that. Yeah. Make your employees part of the process. Ask them what they want, ask them their opinion, but don't just ask them because man, I see so many people doing surveys for their yeah. employees and they never act on anything. Yeah. So if you're, if you're going to ask a question, uh, act on the feedback that you get, even if it's saying we can't, we can't do this at this time and here's why, mm. uh, or, you know, that's one of the things that I've, I've seen and run very successful businesses. And the thing that I, that I've seen and that people do a little bit differently is that you, you really engage the people that work for you. Uh, so, so the people that are there want to be there because they, they want, you know, they take pride in it because it's their business, it's their organization, it's their reputation. Yeah. So, so being sure that you have um, people engaged, you know, because, Man, we talked about this a bazillion times too. absenteeism and presenteeism, even people showing up for work, but not working while they're there. Right. Mm -hmm. Just kind of scrolling through the Internet or doing whatever they can do to let their eight hours pass. Yeah. Uh, A way to kind of nip that in the bud is like engage those employees, you know, keep them informed. Don't try to keep them in the dark about things. Be as transparent as you can be uh, and engage them. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. So how can companies you know, encourage their staff to actually take advantage of the upskilling opportunities that they might be offering them? I would say uh, really find new and different ways because a a lot of people just rely on LMS, you know, just management systems to kind of hear, let's just do our annual training, let's do this. But I think if you can make it more personal to people, uh, this is where we kind of get old school, right? We we went to to technology because it was available, it was easy, it it helped us make a a check mark on our list of things to do, but is it really effective? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, uh, I heard somebody complaining once about, sexual harassment training. Oh, God, why do we have to do this? And I tell them, I said, if you've ever been a victim of that, you would appreciate the fact that people have to, to learn about this. So there are a reason why we do some things. And I think making things more personal to the people that we're trying to support and uh, educate and yeah. uh, encourage to do better would, would encourage them to, to be more active in that process. So back going back to one of those poll questions we had at the very beginning, somebody said, it's really hard to prove to our upper managers that these upskilling programs are actually important. So 
to give maybe like a highlight reel, what would you say are some of the benefits of investing in these programs for our HR people in the audience to kind of go back to their upper managers or even exec level um, personas with? Um, show them what's not working and oh, why. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Show them what's not working and why it's not working and the impact that doing something different might make. Uh, if it if it if it has to be in in numbers, you know, the yeah. bottom line, uh, show them that if it has to be in turnover rates or whatever it is, where whatever uh, whatever hits them in their heart yeah. <laughs> or their business mind, the labor dollars. Yeah, yeah. whatever that's what, <laughs> whatever's that's hiking what those up. <laughs> yeah. Work on that for sure. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what you need to do. And that's the way to get their attention. Um, I love that. How do you think um, upskilling will actually evolve in years to come? Um, I think, well, so it's a really cool thing. Uh, and I can't remember. I wish I had written down the poll that it was, but we, we I just told you we were looking at workers comp and overall uh, as in the U S work comp uh, claims are kind of declining and it's like, okay, so are we building safer workspaces? Yeah. Uh, you know, what are we doing? And, and there was a, a, a research study that was put out that, um, now fewer people are, well, there are more people doing gig work. So kind of like independent uh, remote type work yeah. where they aren't, you know, at work spaces, they're kind of doing their own thing. That's a really cool thing. Number two, we are building safer workplaces, which is a good thing. Uh, but I think as our, as our, the way that we work evolves, we're going to see some really kind of cool things uh, and cool ways to, to upskill uh, again, collaboration. I think that's a big, big thing. Okay. Anytime that you can collaborate with somebody um, in, in a similar industry, that helps. Yep. I love that. Collaboration, communication, mm -hmm. all the C's. Right. For sure. I want to turn to this next slide and actually flipping the script a little bit on building a successful upskilling program. So taking this slide into consideration, um, my question for you, Sheila, is what are the key factors that should be considered when designing an upskilling program? And let's say we're designing this program from the very beginning, the very baseline. Let's say there's no protocols in place. Yeah, this is a good place where uh, starting with the end in mind is, is very um, beneficial to you. Because if you know where you want to go, you can kind of backtrack and build the steps and the ways to get there. Um, but really, I love this where it says empower your employees, because, well, you know, what, what exactly does that mean? You know, a lot of people we hear that so much. But, you know, what does that mean? Well, it means including your employees and, and actually asking and listening to what they say. Right. And yeah. giving them the autonomy to, to, to make a difference in your organization. Um, so really uh, planning, assessing the needs of the organization um, and even watching your clientele and talking to your clientele, your customers will, will help tell you, too. It's not just your employees that will tell you what your organization needs as far as upskilling. You know, your customers will let you know that, too. Mm, yeah. So just just being open uh, to all the places and trying to um, keep those blinders off and really um, be objective about the way that you look at your organization and its successes and failures and learn from those failures, but don't be afraid to, you know, to, to fail at something, you know, because a lot of times you can have the best laid plan, but you can't foresee the future and all the variables that might impact that. Sure. Um, so, so building contingencies into things is always a really good way to, to maintain consistency in those programs, even when you have failures. So I think it's, really important that you highlighted the importance of talking to your customers or whoever you're servicing in any aspect. So for example, I was talking to um, a retail manager of a, a pretty small, small chain, but he said what they do is when the cash register uh, is checking out the customer, uh, they always ask instead of, did anyone help you today? They ask, is there anything that we could have made your experience better? And that opens up a little bit more open-ended than, oh, yeah. that person over there helped me. And they're like, great, perfect. Like right. <laughs> done and dusted. It's right. a little more, uh, you know, the labeling wasn't necessarily easy for me to navigate the store, mm -hmm. or I actually wasn't able to find a price tag on this, whatever it is. So it actually helped narrow in on some things that were logistically wrong with the store opposed to even just from the person centric approach of their staff it opened up the doors to a much wider, wider audience and also helped upskill, you know, their staff in terms of communication aspect, uh, people management skills, that sort of thing. So for those who are cash register 
um, or a cashier who want to work up to a mid-manager level, they can really prove themselves by saying, I actually was talking to a couple of customers the other day and here's what they had to say. That's really cool. Um, I think a lot, we're so afraid to ask questions and I don't know why, um, yeah. you know, because that's the best way to, to find out what people want, right? It's just ask or whether or not you can do something, just ask what would, what would be better, this or that. I love giving people options uh, because, you know, you, we think of, we can think of limited things based on our experience, our values, you know, uh, in our education. But when you ask other people or get input from other places, man, it, it just makes things so much better. Definitely. Definitely. I love the question that Karen had in the chat. Karen, I'm going to tag that question for our Q&A and we'll be sure to get around to that. But everyone, feel free to drop in those questions. I love seeing and hearing from you guys. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. My other question for you, um, Sheila, is what are some of the best practices for structuring upskilling programs in terms of delivery uh, to your employees and even maybe just the format of these programs? I really think assessing the needs of the organization, you know, just really taking a true look at what you need, because a lot of times people think they, they you know, they'll go online and do a search or, do you know, do whatever. They have friends that tell yeah. them we did this and it was really successful. But I really think knowing your business and knowing what your business needs and knowing what uh, objectives you're not meeting, uh, because then you can say, OK, well, we're not doing these things. So maybe if we kind of developed our training more toward this, uh, it would help. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, I say, listen, listen to your people, uh, just best practices are, are making a plan, <laughs> you know, having a plan, uh, not being afraid to, to reassess things, you know, and say, well, this isn't working and here's why Right. And this, you know, this isn't working for us and here's why, and really kind of, um, trying to be a little bit innovative in the way that you do things, uh, just because everybody else does things a particular way doesn't mean that you have to do it that way in your business. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, an example of that recently, I was working with an insurance group and so, and they sell insurance and that's, you know, they sell uh, all types of insurance, employee benefits, you know, they do the whole gamut. And I was like, so here's a cool thing. What if along with your, what, what else, you know, what if along with your insurance, you could offer your customers more, you know, what more, what more would they need or want? Where do you see in working with your groups? Uh, where do you see struggles or challenges? You know, and it's always well in HR, you know, it's the administration of the programs. Yeah. What, can you, what can you do as an organization, you know, to make things better for somebody else? Could you offer HR training? Could you partner them with somebody that can go in and kind of assist them in uh, administering programs? You know, what are the things that you can do? So I would say really best practices is always looking for, the, for a better way to do it. Don't mm -hmm. just settle. Settling gets us into so much trouble. <laughs> There's definitely not a one size fits all. That's right. for sure. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. I asked the poll question, uh, do you currently have any upskilling programs or practices in place? Around, I mean, over 50% are saying no or unsure. So mm -hmm. for those who are starting at the very, very baseline, what would you say is the first step that should be made? So it depends on where we're, where we're talking from. So if we're talking from an employee standpoint, mm -hmm. uh, I would say kind of look at where you are and what you're doing and where you want to go. And okay. let's make a roadmap to where you want to go. You know, talk to your employer about your, your objectives and goals. If you can do it with that employer, you know, so have those conversations. Uh, if, you're, if you're an employer that is not currently offering those things, I would say, again, ask your employees what they want. You know, yeah. take a look at the shortfalls in your organization and um, maybe try just adding one or two things. It could be something as simple as a you know, manager chat night. You know, you could all get together yeah. for coffee and just kind of talk about we're going to talk about these things. Keep it directed. Otherwise, it might become a gripe session. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but if you keep it directed and you have an agenda and you know the things that you're going to talk about, it's a great way to get feedback from your employees. Mm -hmm. And it's a great way to hear the things that they want to want to know in ways that they want to grow with your organization. That's great. And I think it really keeps in mind, including the employees from the very beginning. So even if you're looking at this slide, right, we have number one, for those of you who are just listening in, I'll shout it out. Number one, we have empower your employees. Number two, show where ideas go. And three, provide a roadmap. If we were to create like a point zero before that one, it's lay out the roadmap but lay out the roadmap with your staff, right? Make sure that they're included in every step of the way of each of these points. I think that's so important. 
Robert, I want to call you out because you are just the best always coming to these webinars. And he brought in a really good point. He said, one thing that I like to do is give random employee evaluations, which gives the employee an idea of where they stand, what we need to do to grow together as a company, and also gives us, the employer, an idea of where and how they want to grow within the company. Again, random evaluations versus 30, 60, 90 day check-ins, that sort of thing. Right. There's difference within each company and how they like to do things. And I think what's great about Robert is it seems like he's talked with his staff on how they like things done. If they're all gung ho for random evaluations and they like it and they think it's the most authentic way that they can give their feedback to him. Amazing. If people are more likely to be consistent and feel like I could prepare for this next 30 day check-in or, you know, two week check-in, however often you do it on a more regular basis. Amazing. You know, it, it all depends. I love that. Um, yeah. I see so many places that don't even do any type of evaluation or they, they do those annual evaluations that are absolutely worthless because they, <laughs> yeah. a, they're, they're not in line with anybody's job description and B, you know, how are you going to, if you're not keeping, if you're not talking to your people on a regular basis sure, uh, and you're not keeping track of the good things and the, and the things that they're struggling with, how do you know at the end of the year what they've done? Yep. Uh, you know, so yeah, I, I applaud Robert and I, I would encourage everybody to, if you're not doing something like that, uh, to start doing something like that, even if it's quarterly, just a quarterly check in. And it doesn't have to be a big formal sit down and everything. Uh, you know, maybe if you're the HR director and you have a HR folder, if you see somebody doing something great, just like, you know, make a sticky note and pop it in there. So, you know, you remember to talk to them about it or, you yeah. know, do, do something right then, you know, like to acknowledge them, give them a card, give them a pat on the back. Talk to your people first, though, I would say, and find out what motivates them and what encourages them. So you're not just blanket given, you know, Starbucks cards <laughs> across the board. Yeah. Maybe that doesn't mean anything. To we people. don't need to throw money at it. Right. We need to throw money so, at the problem. <laughs> Yeah. So getting to know your people and understanding what makes them tick and what's going to make them tick for your organization. Yeah. That's, that's a really cool thing right there. Uh, and people just kind of scratch their heads when I say that. I'm like, oh, it's so easy to do that. You know, totally. you know, this is this is your business. This is your life's passion. Don't you want people that it, that are part of that with you to like be moving your charge forward? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's do that. I love that. Yeah. A little sidebar in terms of the timing of these feedbacks, we find on our side of things, this is a very small feature of what we do is automated feedback. So you kind of, the second that they clock out within their app, they actually get like a, Hey, do you guys, uh, or do you want to give your feedback or is there anything you want to report? It's like a, whatever question survey you want it to be. Usually it's just a couple questions, but right after they clock out is the higher likelihood chance that they'll actually fill it out. You know, yeah. serotonin's rushing. They're happy to be clocked out of work, whatever it might be. Right. And when they have that uh, feedback, they're often more likely to fill it out and give a more honest opinion. So I think that's a really good tip. Awesome. Um, yeah. Going off of this feedback theme that we've got going on, how do you incorporate uh, said feedback from employees into the design and implementation of these upskilling programs? Well, so once you once people tell you what they want uh, and if it meets uh, the objectives of your organization, which you will know if you're watching your your business plan and you're doing things in conjunction with with the uh, the whole foundation of the way and the why that you do business, mm -hmm. uh, then just slowly start to develop those. And again, uh, it doesn't have I think this is where people get kind of overwhelmed because they think it has to be this big grand thing. And it doesn't. So a lot of times you can just start small. Um, what it, it could be even like we have so many resources in the world. You know, it doesn't have to cost an organization a ton of money. Um, you know, talk to your friends and neighbors and see what they're doing. You know, what works for you? What's working for you in business? What are your what are your people doing? We, You know, you want to be uh, cost aware of, of what you're doing, but also you want to make an impact. Yeah. So try to find the things that are really going to make an impact. Um, and again, it, it could be as, as simple as finding a mentor for that person. And it might be somebody that's, you know, it, it might be the CEO or your organization just needs to come and talk to a couple of your people to kind of get them motivated or, or listen to what they are, they're having to say yeah. uh, and, and giving them feedback on how they got to where they are, you know, and then making steps. But I think planning is such a big part and we kind of miss that. You know, we just miss that altogether. Uh, when, a, when a person gets onboarded, uh, 
and, and oh, I have a great onboarding story about it. I want to tell you so badly. Yeah. But so when a person gets onboarded, uh, provide that roadmap, have a plan for them. Sure. The best way to make those those plans and programs is know where you're going and have a plan to get there. And yeah, you can make adjustments as you need to along the way. Uh, but that's just it. Plan for it. Plan for it. So simple. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to tell you the story and, and this is, this is a hundred percent what not to do with your employees and onboard. I love it. I, love so it. I was in an organization in, and, um, so the person, so I was working, con doing consulting at this organization. And one day this employee shows up and like, nobody knew the person was supposed to be there. They knew a person was coming. They didn't know when they didn't know who, and there was whoever was the trainer for that organization. I was working with them on financing that day. Um, the, the training person like didn't relay information. So they were like, you know, just, you know, sit here and here's our employee handbook and you can just sit here in this cubicle today and read the handbook. And so that was the first day. And the second day there was like no welcome, no anybody there to meet him, greet him, right. do anything for him. Second day, nobody still had any information. We called HR. Apparently the hiring person hadn't communicated to HR that the person was even going to be there. Um, <sighs> Where they, they hadn't done paperwork or anything. So again, the guy just sits in his cubicle. This is oh, day two. So day three comes the same thing. Nothing. Nobody knew what to do for him. Nobody could give him instructions. Nobody could help him. You know, this is, you know, remote HR. So they're not on site. Uh, nobody <laughs> knew what to do. Uh, and then, you know, I was leaving, you know, that day and I was like, well, I get, we'll see you tomorrow. Right. And he was like, no, I'm not coming back. I'm done. <laughs> I was like, oh, OK, so sorry. Oh, uh, my God. Yeah. So, But, you know, I see that too frequently, you know, yeah. where people just aren't taking care of their people from the very beginning. And if you're really concerned about turnover and retention, mm -hmm. yeah, start right there. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. That just oh my god I mean those first couple of days are absolutely crucial for right. sure I, I mean I, just, I felt so bad for the guy I was like yeah yeah and I wasn't even on staff there not you know I was feeling bad seeing yeah him. yeah you're like just watching this you know crumble before your eyes you know, this is great stuff for training Let me yeah, exactly. down, so. you're like I will be reciting this exact story <laughs> in a webinar a couple of weeks later or months right. yeah for sure oh my god that's ridiculous yeah I, I wanted to quickly um shout out some things in the chat we've got going on uh Bonetta said we do quarterly communication points on our reviews I would love to hear more about those points if you don't mind sharing that in the chat, Bonetta. That sounds very interesting, and I'm sure our audience would love to hear from you as well. Um, Hector says, find out what's important to them and make it important to you. Win hearts and minds. You also, mm -hmm. I think that's such an amazing, amazing point. Henry uh, asked a great question. Henry, we'll, I'll be sure to tag that, and we'll be sure to get around to that at the very end. Um, and yeah, that's that's so great. I, I completely agree, and especially with onboarding. It is so mm -hmm. important to make so important. sure that, you know, you have something in place that is showcasing what your company is. Exactly. And you want to make sure that it's a good place to work to obviously lower that turnover rate at the end of the day. Yeah. Awesome. I wanted to quickly talk about measuring success before we get in that Q&A section. So going off of uh, this slide right here, I know, super exciting, guys. We got a lot of rates and probably equations that we can look up later. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask you, Sheila, what metrics do you use to measure the success of upskilling initiatives? Um, the impact of it. Love Whether it. it be, you know, what what is it that you're trying to, to do better? What is it that you're trying to find out? Just kind of knowing what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is going to help you determine what you need to be tracking. Um, honestly, I, I'm a people first person. So I, looking at this list. I not even satisfaction rate. I would I would say what impact employee did this make for you? Yeah. Um, you know, was it was it good? Was it bad? What would you do differently? Um, you know, and I think just, you know, keeping people your people, I, my KPIs, I saw this the other day and I loved it. So instead of KPI like um, performance indicators, it was keep people interested, keep people I informed, love that. keep I people love involved, that. Yeah. And keep people inspired. And I was like, oh, that's my new thing. Oh my and God, that's I awesome. That so much. Um, because we, I think a lot of times we, you got to know what you're looking to change. A lot of yeah. times people just want to say, well, we need to measure this and we need to measure that. Mm -hmm. But why? You know, yeah. what impact are you trying to make before you determine, you know, what you need to do uh, or 
which one of those is going to be important? What outcome are you trying to get? And, mm -hmm. and did you reach it? <laughs> I mean, did you did you optimize your workflow? Did you streamline your operations? Uh, have you enriched your customer service experience? You right. Know? So just depending on the um, the industry and the outcome that you're 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 searching for, mm -hmm. but definitely training ROI. Uh, you know, you have to know what impact you're seeking to make in order to measure some of those things. Yeah. And again, going back to that one poll question we had at the very beginning and talking about proving it to your upper managers or higher up executives that these programs are worth the money and labor dollars, mm -hmm. giving them the numbers. You know, a lot of these people who are in the CEO, CFO positions, even CHROs, right? And some of you might be on this call, but are, are way more quantitatively set in stone, right? Instead of qualitative, where they're focusing more on the person-centric approach, they want to see the hard-hitting numbers. Mm -hmm. Calling out a couple of these, like training ROI and even, um, you know, post-training assessment results and comparing and contrasting the success rate of those mm -hmm. and seeing what the turnover rate looks like before and after these programs, Right. that's how mm -hmm. you get the money. You know, that's how you get the labor dollars put back in your pocket for HR. And I think that is so important and making mm -hmm. sure that you guys are empowered with your own metrics is absolutely key in my eyes. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, just, yeah, so, some things people do because they see other people doing it. But what I would say, make it personal. I know a lot of times they say, don't make it personal. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, your business is personal. That's why you started your business, right? That's why I work for myself and not for somebody else. Yeah. Uh, because to me, it's easier. I can make a larger impact doing this for organizations and I can sitting, you know, in, in one space, you know, just processing things all day long. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I did that for a long, long time. And I love doing that. And I learned so much. But this was my up skill, right? Right. To take on a new something brand new and something kind of out of the box for me. So yeah. I love it. And a follow-up question for that. If let's say a company that you're working with is asking the questions, all right, what's the ROI of these upskilling programs? How would you what would you say to inform them on that aspect? Would you give them an equation that they can calculate or are you just gonna say, you know, just trust the process? Yeah, I I'm like I said, I'm more people centric. So I'm going to ask them, what are you what are you trying to achieve by offering this, by providing this for your employees? What results are you looking for? Sure. And did you achieve your results? Uh, and if you didn't, why? And if you did, why? How? Mm -hmm. How did you do that? Because, you know, you want to duplicate those things. Uh, and then once you once you solve a problem with upskilling, you know, because to me, it's, it's a solution. Upskilling is a solution a lot of times. Yeah. The things that that uh, especially. Um, with, with hourly employees, um, a little bit different there. So it, it can be a solution to a problem. It can be a motivator. Uh, it can be a rerouter. Uh, a lot of times people will get ill with me because I'll go in a place and I'm like, okay, this person doesn't need to work here uh, mm -hmm. because they have a bad attitude and they're poisoning your organization and everybody in it. So, uh, and I've, I've, some of the folks here on the Gulf Coast, they know me. They're like, look, if, if you if you if you want to get your feelings hurt, call Sheila over to kind of evaluate what you're doing. Because because but I have we have so we have free leadership classes that we do. And I, and I had one leadership class where I had like six people from the same organization. And all they did for six weeks was complain about the organization. Wow. And I told them, I said, you guys might really consider if you're in the right place. And I said, I hate to tell people to leave their job. And I love your employer. So I hate to tell them that I just told all their employees to quit. Um, <laughs> yeah. But really, it was the best. It's the best thing. It was the yeah. best thing for them. And it was the best thing for that organization because the customers that they were serving weren't getting quality service based on their attitudes about their work. Um, and if, if, and I told him, and we did this big communication intervention thing and I was finally like, okay, you guys need to go and you need to let them go and you need to go ahead and start looking for yeah. people, to, people. And look, I know all these great people. Let me kind of help you find a better place for you, a better fit for you. Yeah. And so, sometimes it takes that, you know, sometimes you have to shake things up like that. But the really cool thing with that is I'm very happy to report that even though in that particular instance, all those people did part ways, everybody is doing great now and everybody is so much happier and so much more productive because they're in the right seat. They're doing yeah. the right thing. So it makes a difference. Totally. Yeah. I think that push and pull, especially between organizational levels, if you're talking mm -hmm. entry mid to upper, it's so important that everyone is understanding of their role 
and making sure that they're content in their role. And if they see themselves higher than where they're at, even having that open conversation, talking about that and seeing what skills that they want to get to that maybe manager role, mid manager, right. upper manager, even, and that builds loyalty. That's a, the big, big, like benefit of all of this is, is it really builds loyalty, retention, engagement, lowers turnover, all that good stuff. It really does. I mean, and that's how you uh, optimize, you know, that's how you measure these things. So that's how that da yeah. data analysis, you, that's how you use it to evaluate the effectiveness of your programs. 100%. Right. Yeah. hundred percent. That's such a good point. <laughs> Robert had another really great anecdote. I just wanted to shout out in the chat. He said, some issues come from upper management. I've seen far too often when a CEO or a member of upper management has the attitude of, I'm better than you. Mm -hmm. And that will destroy business. You have to have the mindset of we are one team. And I like to remind my staff of, staff of that often. That one-on-one -on -one time with my employees has helped us succeed. I think mm -hmm. that is a brilliant, brilliant point, Robert. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, that's a good point. And having those um, uh, crucial conversations with people or courageous mm -hmm. conversations, depending on how you look at it, yeah. um, th those are important. I know a lot of times people avoid having difficult conversations but what a better way to strengthen a team. Oh, my gosh. Than just having some of those hard things. And, you know, maybe you do need to shout it out, you know, with a mediator in the room. Maybe you do need to, like, get all those emotions out and, you know, emotional intelligence. That's another thing that that we're doing a lot of upskilling with uh, right. how to develop emotional intelligence. It's cool stuff that we're doing. Um, but, you know, having those conversations that kind of hurt. Uh, you know, to, to get to a, a better or different place. That helps, too, because I've, I've worked with some organizations where I've honestly just had to go in and mediate, you know, through through performance evaluations yeah. uh, and that sort of thing. But now when I look at those organizations and they're, you know, they're growing, they're doing great things and, and they have the tools now, they know what to do. And their their leaders are now equipped to have those conversations. You don't have to call in somebody from the outside because we've we've taught them how to how to manage their people a little bit better and how to have those open and honest conversations uh, and how to be receptive you know, to the feedback from the employee when it's not what you want to hear too. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a good point. I want to quickly end on a high note on asking one or two top tips, actions, or takeaways that you would give the audience and how to better upskill shift workers at the end of the day. Um, again, depending on which side you're coming from. So if yeah. you're an employer, um, I would say make a plan, have a plan for your, for your people, have a, have a people plan. Um, no, if there's a natural progression, uh, because people want to grow at their jobs, right? So if wow. there's a natural progression, a step progression from this job to that job to that job, have that roadmap already laid out and prepared. So when when you're bringing people into that job, they know there's not a question and it's not getting shifted as they go because they have it. They know where they're going and they can decide whether or not it's for them. Mm. Uh, because that's what's going to make all the difference, right? That's going to help you with your retention. Uh, if, if you're honest and transparent in the job and what it is when people come on board and they know that they have a plan to, to progress in that world, uh, then, then a lot of times that's going to be all they need. Yeah. Um, if you're an employee and you're sitting at your desk and you're twiddling your thumbs, you're like, oh, I don't want to go to work today. It's time to make a change. Yeah. Uh, so go ahead and start making those steps towards making that change. Find out where you want to go. Work backwards. What are the steps that you need to do in order to get there and start making those steps? You can do you don't have to quit your job to start making those steps. You can start making steps toward a, an upskilled or reskilled life right where you are. You know, it doesn't have to be a grand gesture. And that way, you know, it's a whole lot less stressful uh, when you do it that way. And it, it is possible. So I would encourage people to do that. I love that. That's so great. I want to move on to the Q&A section as we have a couple minutes left. And first, I want to prioritize those who are asking the questions live versus those who have emailed them in. If you do have a question, send it over in the chat. We would love to answer those for you. Starting off strong with Karen's question. Karen asks, what is your best response to a small business owner who says, quote, I don't want to do that because then they will have all these skills and leave to go somewhere else or open their own business? This is a great question, Karen. Yeah. Thank you for it kind of reminds me, though, of the, the experience I had with the organization where people needed to part ways. Yeah. You know, uh, if, if you're a person who um, 
who has plans and who wants to work well, who just wants to get in a job where you can rock and roll and do great things, but your employer, you know, doesn't want to do that because they want to keep you protected and guarded and in their box. Well, are, do you really want to work there? Mm. And if you're an employer, do you really want people that you just hold right here and you don't allow them to blossom or to innovate or to do new things and great things that are make your business better? Mm -hmm. um, so I think you can have those conversations. I love you. I love what you're doing. I want to stay here, but here's what I'm going to need as an employee in order to, to stay and help your business grow. Have those conversations. Don't be afraid yeah. to have those conversations with people. That's a good point. And, and truly, I do think that is a very real fear, Karen. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I can see where you're coming from with that. But also on the counter of those that are the naysayers that are saying upskilling shouldn't happen because then they'll have all these skills and be empowered to leave. But regardless of if you're going to offer these skills or not, they were going to leave regardless. Right. Truly, yeah. I believe that. If there is a, somebody that joined the company who had their dreams of starting up their own company, whether it's in the same realm of your industry or not, they were going to do that with yours or your company or mm -hmm. not regardless. So it just depends on who you have on board and kind of letting them go. And I truly mm -hmm. believe having those upskilling programs probably keeps those who are actually going to feel like they're going to end up leaving the moment that they join the company or sign, you know, sign on to the company. It actually probably keeps them on longer than they anticipated mm -hmm. because they don't want to leave. <laughs> they yeah. learned so much and they are like probably thinking to themselves, if I leave, I'm not going to get all these great programs and initiatives. I'm not going to be able to upskill on mm -hmm. A, B and C skills. So yeah, it's don't however you frame it. Yeah. Yeah. And not just hiring warm bodies, you know, yes, that's another exactly. thing. Exactly. You know, I mean, you're going to build a bad team if you're yeah. hiring people that don't care about their own self-development. Exactly. A lot of times those are the folks that just that take all the, the goods and run. Right. Uh, so be sure that you have those conversations when you're interviewing people. You know, we were looking for long term employees. What would it take to, to have you you know commit to us for whatever period? You know, and and some places some places sign contracts now, some places not so much. But I, I totally. think again, just just being open and having those conversations, and honestly, being a place where people want to work. You know, you can go anywhere and be a mediocre employee. You can work for a mediocre employer. Uh, if you're an employer, be an awesome employer. You know, yeah. I, I used to always I, 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 here in town there was one company that's like we're the best, we're the best. And I was like, no, but you're really not. Saying that you're the best doesn't make you the best. Being the right. best makes you the best. So what are the things that you're doing to be the best in your industry and really do it? I love that. George gave an amazing statistic. He said, statistics show that workers will stay with an organization if you offer them professional growth and action learning plans with measurable, observable desired results. So mm -hmm. That is a great point. Thank you, George, for that one. Okay. Henry asked, what should be a good ratio in terms of attitude versus aptitude to consider an employee for upskilling? Um, man, that's a good question, but it's a hard question. I don't know yeah. that I can put a number to that. I would just say, yeah. again, have, know who you are as an employer and what you need. Number two, have those honest conversations with people. If somebody uh, has the um, desire but not the ability, uh, take a look at them. Do you, can they are they trainable? You know, if, if they're coachable or trainable, then, you know, maybe you can help them grow that skill. Some things, you know, a lot of things you can you can teach um, and some things you just can't. So I, I, I don't really know that there's a really good ratio, but I would say you would have to look at each individual and determine if they're the best fit for your organization or for the for the position that they're in yeah. or, or where they want to grow to. Yeah. Even more important, almost. Mm -hmm. Hector asked, what if they stay and we don't train them? That is a really interesting question. Um, if people stay and you don't train them, even, <laughs> you just ride the, ride, the, ride the wave, right? So there you've got, you, you know, uh, you're, you're being mediocre and so are they. If you're meeting all the objectives yeah. and if you're, if you're checking all the boxes and if that's what's important to you as a business owner or an organization, awesome. Keep rolling with yeah. it. Uh, but if it's working for you, you know, that's good. If you ever want to level up in business or if you ever want to level up in your employee base, uh, then you look at things a little bit differently. But as long as uh, all your objectives are getting met and you're comfortable with that. Mm. OK. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm. you know, I was going to ask the follow up question to Hector asking, you know, if these employees that he's possibly talking about, I'm not even sure if these are actual 
uh, people on his team. But if there's someone that swore on the front lines, you know, you run into those people that are very content, you know, working at the entry level job, don't necessarily have any big dreams of moving up and they're loyal to the company and they're fine with that. And they don't necessarily have any qualms about it. And they're not necessarily fussed about anything in particular. They don't necessarily have any big dreams. And I think that's fine. I don't think it's your job to inspire every single human. Your job is to inspire those that want to be inspired and calling those people out and making sure that they're getting the recognition that they deserve and they're actually getting the promotions that they deserve. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we do need steady eddies in the workplace. Totally. We need people that are there every day doing the things to keep the things going. Uh, And and we need to be okay with that. Right. hundred percent. We need 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Hector said, no, that's what I tell managers. Oh, well, it's so, it's so they can think in a different way. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's great. Hey, whatever works. As we said, there's no best practices for one size fits all. <laughs> right. That's true. Awesome. All right. Well, as we are up on the hour mark, I wanted to quickly um, share those handouts that we have today. We have this great article. It sums up almost everything that we've talked about today, talking a lot about skills management, exactly what it is. We also have this amazing, amazing PDF from Sheila and her team over at Gulf Coast Training. It's a really good starting point. I'm just really writing things out, talking about that roadmap. This is a really awesome place to start. For those that have participated in the Q&A and the chat, thank you guys so much for coming on. And quickly, I'm going to stop the recording so we don't share out those PDC IDs (laughs) super quickly.